Sure. Uh, so on behalf of Merck Animal Health, uh, our technical services group, and our sales force, I'd like to welcome everybody to this sixth annual Southeastern Stalker Vet Conference. Uh, it is a pleasure to have everybody here and to have so many participants is, is, is very, uh, very humbling for us. Uh, we hope the information you get tonight is useful for you. We hope that you have a, an enjoyable time with it. There is a test that you have to take at the end of this program. Uh, we will have a review session at the end, and I would highly recommend that you attend the review session because it it will help you pass. Let me just put it that way. Uh, so anyway, with that, I think we will go ahead and progress in with our program, and I'll introduce our first speaker tonight, and that is going to be Dr. Tim Parks. Dr. Parks is from Halton, Kansas. He's a 1994 graduate from the great veterinary college in Kansas. Uh, he joined our little outfit back in around 2015, and he has been a very good asset, uh, not only to Merck Animal Health, but the, to the producers and the sales rep that he works with. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Parks. First of all, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you guys for uh, giving us some of your time over uh, to, to go over some of the, the new research that we have as well as just other topics around the stalker uh, sector. I always enjoy this meeting and, and the work that uh, Dr. Newcomb puts into getting it put together. always look forward to going to uh, Mississippi State and spending a couple days, unfortunately, in this, in this day of COVID. Uh, we're going to we're going to have to do this in the virtual manner. So uh, we do appreciate your time. We know it's a commitment uh, to give us the amount of time uh, to get get all the information that we have. Uh, and we sure appreciate that and, and hope it's well worth your uh, with the time you give us. So my name is Tim Parks. I'm tech service manager with Merck Animal Health. Uh, I live in Holton, Kansas, and, and my main area is Kansas, Missouri and Oklahoma. Uh, over the past summer, I had the opportunity to do some research uh, down in, in Texas uh, with the new nasal gen 3 product and really with the focus around safety and efficacy. Um, and in this particular case, we were looking at nasal gen 3 and Vista 5 as a, using Vista 5 as a, a positive control. So um, over the next little bit here, we're going to uh, just go over the findings and, and uh, discuss what we found as we, as we work through this. Uh, this project uh, was done down in Canyon, Texas with uh, at the Agra Research Center with uh, Dr. David Bechtel as well as Audie Waite. Um, we also had Dr. John Richardson with West Texas A&M involved with this study and, and he brought along um, Hudson McAllister who's a master's candidate at West Texas A&M and, and this became Hudson's, uh, Hudson's project and she's the one that uh, did the data collection and, and did data analysis and, and uh, final reports and things along those lines. Uh, I had the opportunity to be a monitor uh, with Merck and also included uh, Cashley Swear, who's a, a sales rep uh, out in western Kansas, out in the Garden City area. And then also Dr. Dina Hardy, who's there in Canyon, Texas with, with Merck. Uh, uh, she also spent quite a bit of time with us uh, in, in this particular study. So as we look at uh, where this study came from with nasal gen 3 coming to the market, uh, we have a lot of efficacy work that has been done. We have DOI work that's been done and we had some safety work that was done uh, and needed for to, to get approval of the product. Uh, but we wanted to check and see what the safety was of this product and, and efficacy was when we put these products into these higher risk, uh, higher risk cattle that are entering the feed yard. Uh, there's been numerous studies over the years uh, that have been done that evaluate the difference between the route of administration comparing internasal to a parenteral sub-Q or intermuscular uh, vaccination. And as you look at those studies, there's, um, you know, they're like most studies, they're, they're pretty variable and uh, there's little to no difference that has been seen uh, as we look at how those vaccines are administered. One of the other things that has been looked at, and this is something that Dr. Richardson has been very involved in, is the timing of vaccine. Uh, is vaccination at the time uh, arrival of cattle in the feed yard better than if we delay vaccination? And, and Dr. Richardson has done a lot of work um, 
looking at delaying vaccination out to 28 days and and as a standard procedure delays vaccination of uh, the viral vaccines out to uh, 28 days uh, at the feed yard there at West Texas A&M. But in setting up the study, all of that delay work had been that he'd done had been done utilizing uh, parenteral vaccinations and not uh, not looking at uh, what happens when we're using uh, using intranasal vaccines. So the objective of this study, again, it is really started out as safety, but uh, when we're looking at safety of the product in these high risk cattle, um, there's other things that we can look at and and we elected to do a 56 day study considering a, a, a kind of a typical background type scenario in these animals but the safety was the was at the forefront of what we were looking at and safety data was summarized to, from day zero to 28 after arrival and then the other thing that we looked at was uh, just look at the efficacy of nasal gen 3 and vista 5 when we administer it to this class of animals and whether uh, compare the difference between administering vaccination on arrival or 28 days after arrival. And as we look at the primary variables, what we're focused on was morbidity, mortality, and growth performances through the 56-day receiving uh, background type uh, setting. Some secondary variables that we included into this study um, with with Hudson using this as a master's project was we did want to go ahead and look at some IgG titer uh, evaluations towards IBR, BRSV, and BVD type 1 to see what type of changes we see uh, as we as we look at uh, at the vaccination the route of administration but also as we look at delay to see do we have natural exposure that may end up with creating a scenario where a lot of these animals actually serial convert um, you know in that first 28 days uh, just by natural exposure if we look at study design, the study design behind this is a randomized complete block with a two by two factorial arrangement for the treatments. So the two primary variables that we're looking at again are route of viral vaccine administration. So either intranasal with nasal gen 3 or subcutaneously with uh, Vista 5. And then also the time of vaccine administration. So either vaccination on arrival to the feed yard or letting them set for 28 days and waiting 28 days to give the viral vaccines. This was designed as a small pen study. Uh, we had 15 pens per treatment. Uh, we had 10 head per pen, so the pen was our experimental unit. And the animals that we used, these were heifers that came out of the Southeast Auction uh, barns. Uh, they were weighing anywhere from 450 to 600 pounds. Uh, they were large percentage, 70% were Angus cross, 20% Charlotte cross, and then 10% other crosses. As we ran the cattle through and, uh, and rolled cattle into this study, we looked at back tags uh, from the sale barns and we found cattle that had represented six different states and 13 different livestock auctions. So as we're trying to set this up, our goal is high risk cattle and, and, and by definition we had, we had commingled long haul uh, cattle uh, that came through the sale barn that, that helped fit that. And as we start to look at some of our, as we start to look at some of the uh, the outcomes, uh, you'll see that some of the pull rates weren't as high as what might be expected, but uh, with some with some high risk cattle. But this was a this was a study that we started in April, uh, April and May of last year. So, uh, so we have uh, have spring high risk cattle as compared to some of the high risk cattle that we see this time of year. If we look at the treatment groups in the two by two design, again, route administration and time administration are two primary variables. So treatment one was uh, nasal gen three given uh, intranasally on arrival day zero. Uh, and along with nasal gen 3 to complete the uh, the viral um, antigen that we see in Vista 5, we added Vista BVD sub Q. Uh, so we're giving nasal gen 3, which is the IBR, BRSV, and PI3 intranasally, and then our BVD type 1 and 2 sub Q. Uh, treatment group 2 was Vista 5 on arrival. Treatment group 3 was Vista 5. Um, day 28 and treatment group four was nasal gen 3 and vista bvd on day 28. as we look at the processing of these cattle viral vaccines were administered according to the treatment group assignment that they were randomized to 
but all cattle receive the other processings uh, that, that are listed here. Um, as many of you guys know, and, and Dr. Nickel, uh, Jason Nichols talked a little bit about where we are with some of our technologies. Um, all these animals had all flex SCR activity monitoring tags uh, put in them. So these tags allowed us to uh, look at activity uh, of the cattle throughout the day, also look at rumination. And um, we, we collected a lot of that data, but as you start to uh, look at 600 head of cattle and, and the activity that's taken place and, and the spreadsheets that end up, uh, that we end up creating, it becomes a very, very large amount of data because of the way that these, uh, that, that, that data is recorded. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we did see with that. Um, all cattle on arrival received Vision 7 Sub-Q. Uh, they got Vetramec Plus and Safeguard as a deworming combination. Uh, they were all given Ralgro implant, um, and they all received Zaprevo at 1 cc per 100 pounds. These cattle were uh, randomized to, to their treatment using the computer randomization schedule. We collected individual weights on day 0, 28, and 56, and a subset of three head per treatment group were bled on day 0, 28, and 56 to run serum IgG analysis. Uh, and essentially the heifers in those pens that had the lowest tag numbers uh, were the heifers that we bled. So general health observations that we were, uh, that we looked at, through this was uh, they were observed daily by uh, blind, trained blinded uh, personnel. So Dr. Bechtel was our observer and he was not there when any of the animals were enrolled. Um, they assigned a clinical impression score of zero, essentially zero to three with zero being normal and three being morbid. Um, heifers that had a, a clinical impression score of one to three were pulled from the pen, taken to the treatment facility and for further uh, diagnostic uh, diagnostics to be performed. Uh, the temperature was taken. If we had temperature of greater than 104, they were treated according to the treatment protocols that we'll go over here in just a second. If they had a clinical impression score of two or three, they received treatment regardless of the temperature. So uh, clinical impression score of one and a temperature of 104 or greater, they received treatment or uh, clinical suppression of two or three, they received treatment. And the cattle had a five day post metaphylactic interval uh, after after receiving Zaprevo on our the antibiotic treatment schedule that we uh, had in place first pull uh, these animals received Resflor Gold um, second pull or first retreatment uh, they received Batril 100 if they were pulled a third time they received Biomyosin and if they were pulled a fourth time um, they were they were deemed chronic and uh, and re removed from the pen. The ration that these animals received was a uh, was a flake corn alfalfa hay based ration with some dried distillers greens. Um, as we start to look at the performance data, you'll see that these cattle perform extremely well. And uh, as you as we look at studies, and and um, I find it interesting that that we see in a small pen setting when we have animals that uh, come in, they're vaccinated well. Uh, they we put good food in front of them. Um, they got good sources of water, fresh water, um, and you know, in the way these cattle were handed, man, they re they really started well. And and we'll you'll see that as we look at some of the data uh, ahead of us. And as you can see, uh, the the net energy was extremely was extremely uh, good on these on this ration, and these cattle did extremely well. The housing, these cattle were on dirt floor pens, uh, 18 by 52 feet pens, so they had 90, just shy 94 square feet per animal. And each of these cattle had uh, essentially 21 inches of bunk space that they were allowed to, um, uh, that, that they had for, uh, for feet. As we start to get, delve into the results, um, Essentially, there were no adverse events that were reported in any treatment group throughout the 28-day observation period. So nasal gen 3, Vista 5, uh, 
there was no adverse events that, that were seen in that first day, 28 days, and they reported no safety concerns uh, with either of the treatment protocols that they saw in those first 28 days that the uh, that the cattle were in the feed yard. Again, safety is one of the things that we were that we were wanting to look at as we start to look at the internasals in some of these. Um, these higher risk cattle that we know are can can carry some fairly significant dehydration when they come in so so as we start to look at the safety that's that's where we started and and, and the statements from the investigator was that they had no safety concerns and as we look at the use of the product uh you know just in as we see it used out in the field uh and and we follow through any calls that come in we're not getting reports of any safety concerns either associated with it uh, so it's, it's very nice uh, this this study was uh, was nice to to be able to show in in a in this type of setting that there were no concerns then when we start to look at um then when we start to look at the effect of uh uh, uh, BRD percentages, how many cattle we pulled, uh, days to treatment, all those things. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide, and, and I don't want you to focus too much because I've got it broken down as we start to work through it, uh, as we start to work through the data. But the, the big thing that I wanted to look at and uh, want you guys to, to see in this particular scenario is when we do a two-by-two two factorial, uh, what we do is is – when we look at the two primary variables or objectives that we're looking at, the primary variables that we're going to review, which in this case is route and timing, if there's no interaction within that vaccination and the route and the, and the timing, then all of a sudden it, we we really come down to two treatment groups. So now we've got now we've got route of administration uh, and now or, or the vaccine that we're given and and time. Uh, so now we're looking at, you know, what what did we see with that? So and and what we found with this is essentially there was no statistical difference uh, as we start to look at, at the vaccination timing uh, interval. Uh, third treatment, days to third treatment was something that showed up with, that, that had a trend. But as far as statistical differences, there was just nothing that really showed up. So as we start to break it down from there, now if we look at vaccination, so let's look at the route of administration. Um, what we found as we as we put them together was that essentially we had about a 21 percent pull rate both behind Vista 5 and behind uh, Nasalgen 3. Uh, so there was statistically again, there's there's just no difference uh, there. If we look at uh, second pull rates and compare Vista 5 and nasal gen 3 you can see that we had a few more nasal gen 3 again there's no statistical difference I mean there's just numerical differences here as we start to look at this uh, as we look at days to first pull you can see that the average days to first pull uh, in this particular study was on on the Vista cattle or nasal gen was right around 20 days uh, there's one data point here that we'll point out to you is at days to third pull um, if we look at the Vista 5 group you can see that days to third pull is actually shorter than days to second pull and when we first looked at this um, we, we started to go back and, and look at the data but essentially as we look at the Vista 5 group there was so few uh, cattle that were pulled a third time that it actually mathematically we didn't think it was possible but as you really looked at the data it was very real because those cattle those three pulls came very early uh, so that number uh, although it looks uh, as we look at it on a graph it, it is definitely a real number but again as you can see as we look at p-values they, they're just there wasn't a lot of difference when it came to the route of administration. So it didn't matter if it was parenteral or if it was um, internet. As we start to look at mortality and the, the effect of vaccine on mortality, this is where we did start to see a little bit of difference. Uh, and you can see that uh, if we look at the Vista 5, we had 0.3% uh, mortality in the Vista 5 group and about 1.75% chronic rate. If we look at nasal gen 3, uh, we had essentially what we had was a 0.65% um, mortality rate with 4.2% chronics. And as you delve into the data and really start to look at it, one what really drove that that 
chronic percentage was a delayed nasogen. And uh, we've got a breakdown here in a minute that, I, that I'll be able to show you uh, what we were seeing there. But the chronic is statistically different. Uh, there was we saw a, a statistical difference there that that we did have uh, more chronics in the nasal gen three. So then, as we move into the timing of the vaccination, so now uh, on arrival or delayed, what you can see is uh, on arrival we had first pull rate of about 17.7 percent as compared to about 24.7 percent uh, in the delayed group uh, and then as we start to look at second pulls you can see that uh, you can see that the delays we had more as well so as we start to look at the, the p values associated with uh, associated with this uh, essentially, uh, that first pull, there was a trend towards, uh, we, we were seeing a, a trend towards uh, arrival being uh, better, having fewer pulls, uh, first pulls than what we saw in the delayed group. And as Dr. Richardson is looking at this data, you know, he said this was really one of the first times he has seen this scenario. But the other thing that he's seen is as we look at days to first pull, uh, normally he's going to see cattle start to be pulled a lot sooner than what we're seeing here. Uh, you know, right around 20 days is when we were starting to see a lot of these cattle being pulled. As uh, we were following these cattle through and looking at what was going on, one thing that we did see associated with um, with this is a uh, Audi felt like he was having a virus that started to go through these this this particular feed yard. Uh, where these cattle were right there somewhere around day 16, 17, and, and really that's where a lot of these uh, first first pull uh, numbers are coming into play. That third pull, pull percentage, as you can see, uh, was statistically different, again, uh, in, with the delayed animals uh, being much higher than what we saw in the uh, cattle that were vaccinated with the virus on arrival. And then days the third pull again was statistically significant as we as we look at that and we had a lot of those delayed cattle that uh, that we did have more pulls uh, out there around day 30. As we look at mortality and chronics, this is where we did see quite a bit of difference, especially as we look at the chronic percentage and uh, statistically. And as keeping in mind, this was a this was a study that that in, had 15 pins per treatment group. We had 600 head of cattle in there, but you know this is uh, this is one study, and this is what we saw in this case. We did see that in that delayed group, we had quite a few more chronics with us. Definitely a statistical difference showing up uh, between the delayed delayed group and, and the cattle that were vaccinated on arrival. The other thing that we saw here, as you can imagine with the number of chronics and everything else, was we started to see an uh, increase uh, in the antibiotic costs associated with the, the cattle that received vaccination at day 28 as opposed to those cattle receiving vaccination uh, on arrival. Also keep in mind that as we look at arrival and delay, that's that's just vaccination. That's not breaking it out. We're not breaking it out in this particular scenario um, because as to whether it was an intranasal vaccination or parenteral vaccination, just for the simple fact that uh, there was no interaction between route and timing. So again, that just increases our, our power of our study is now we're really looking at, at 30 pins. We're able to compare 30 pins to 30 pins. If we look at mortality in the chronics, you see we had four deads uh, in the 600 head of cattle. Uh, three of them died due to BRD, and, and there was one heifer that died uh, secondary to a rumen bloat. Uh, as we look at removals, uh, we had 13 chronics that came out of the nasal gen 3 group. Uh, we had nine that came out of the delayed group and four that came out of the arrival group. And we had five uh, cattle that um, chronics that came out of the Vista 5 group uh, with the cattle on arrival not having any chronics and, and all five of those animals came out of the delayed group. So now if we move over and we start to look at uh, look at some of the performance data again um, 
I've not broken this out a whole lot because as we start to look at, at what we had, these cattle came in on day zero, weighing essentially around uh, 460 pounds. You know, we, we can see that they're 458 to 462, uh, 453 in the Vista 5 group. Uh, if we look at average daily gain in the first 28 days, we saw some pretty phenomenal gains, which really goes back to demonstrate that these cattle did come in with a lot of shrink, a lot of dehydration. Uh, but as we look at average daily gain over day zero to 56, you know, we saw some pretty phenomenal gains, 3.4, uh, 3.3 to 3.4 uh, pounds a day as we looked at what was going on. But as we start to look at it again, keeping in mind that we have, we have route of administration versus uh, timing uh, and look at that interaction. Was essentially, there's no statistical difference in, in that there's, if we look at that interaction. So again, when we see no difference there, uh, what that creates is that, you know, now uh, takes us down to essentially we have vaccination and we have timing. So, uh, but, even if through that, you can see that in vaccination, uh, there was no statistical difference either. It didn't matter uh, if they uh, got the vaccine intranasally or if they got the vaccine uh, parental. You look at timing, again, there was no statistical differences that, that were demonstrated. As we look at what was taking place within, uh, within these, uh, these particular scenarios. So now the uh, you kind of to kind of wind down and uh, on the the stuff and leave time to you know to to come back on and, and answer any questions that you guys might have. One of the other things that we looked at and this was part of uh, Hudson's uh, master's project was we wanted to look at antibody titers. And as many of you guys are aware, we've had quite a we've done a lot of work with nasal gen IP and and looking at what types of things can we see. Um, associated with driving uh, antibody titers, not just an IgA response, but also an IgG response. And as we consider some of the benefits of intranasal vaccines, it, it becomes pretty apparent that one of them is is the ability to to get around some maternal antibodies and actually stimulate uh, an IgG response. So that was one of the things that uh, we really wanted to look at. The other thing that we wanted to look at with this is is as Dr. Richardson's done a lot of his work, he's found, been able to find that what tends to happen is um, cattle that get delayed to day 28, if you pull and pull titers and look, uh, you tend to find that there's been natural exposure. So essentially, a lot of, by day 28, a lot of those cattle have seroconverted. Uh, to, to IBR, BRSV, things along those lines. So that's one of the things that, that we really wanted to look at in, in this particular scenario. So as you can see on day zero, uh, these animals uh, looking at the antibody titer uh, were, were very com comparable. There's, there's no statistical difference in where we started out in these animals. So then at day 28, uh, we, we ran the animals back through and, and just to go back to how the animals were handled, just so so we're familiar, uh, these animals, uh, even though they may not have received a vaccination on day 28, they all went through the chute. So we collected individual weights and, and then pulled blood on them. So every animal went through the chute uh, essentially three times. Uh, just just through regular treatments but as we look at day 28 we can see that the cattle that received nasalgen and the cattle that received vista on arrival had zero converted uh, we were seeing a little bit of an increase in in the nasalgen delayed group but not statistically different from what we saw in the vista delayed group so so really just wasn't much happening there we did however see a statistically higher level of um, IBR antibody in the cattle that received Vista uh, vaccination. So we, we drove a little bit higher response with the parenteral vaccination than we did uh, with the internasal vaccine. But again, we were able to demonstrate that we are able to create systemic IgG responses with internasal uh, IBR vaccine in nasal Gen 3. Now, as we look at uh, day 56, what we can see is that essentially uh, the cattle that received nasal gen delayed 
increase the cattle that received uh, that received vista delayed had a, had a serological response so we were able to uh, demonstrate that on arrival or day day uh, 28 we still saw the, a very typical type of response and the levels that we saw uh, basically maintained uh, maintained on our our cattle that were vaccinated on arrival as we look at this the next one that we looked at was BVD virus and uh, the virus that's used uh, that was used with along with nasal gen 3 vista BVD uh, CFP is essentially type 1 type 2 BVD that's in vista 5 it's a fallout product where we've it has the same tighter values uh, within the vaccine that vista 5 does we've just removed the uh, IBR uh, PI3 and BRSV fractions so uh, as we look at this data as you can see uh, day zero again we, we started out pretty much so the same uh, we vaccinate the cattle that received the vaccine both being parenteral vaccines and I think again that's also important to remember um, we saw a very similar response no statistical difference in, in what we were seeing there and then as we move out to day 56 uh, we see the same response so so really as, you, as we look at, at the titers uh, we were able to drive very good titers associated with um, uh, with the, the vaccine uh, and you know it didn't matter again it didn't matter if those vaccines were given on arrival or if we waited and those vaccines were given uh, if those vaccines were given out at a later time frame this was the aspect of this that, that we found to be to be fairly uh, interesting is the BRSV uh, portion because if we start at day zero again everybody started zero negative um, but as we go to day 28 as we can see all the animals had zero converted so uh, if we go back and, and think about um, uh, what was seen as we went through this study out there somewhere around day day 20 uh, 18 to 20 is when uh, when they felt like they started to see a virus that was going through uh, going through the uh, the feed yard and as we look at this the evidence to us would be that most likely the virus that went through the feed yard was actually a BRSV virus uh, that, that, that made its way through there because at day 28 all all groups had zero converted uh, it didn't matter it didn't matter if they'd been vaccinated uh, or if they had been not vaccinated we saw zero conversion take place so uh, the one thing that this does do is if we look at our our nasal gen on arrival and our vista 5 on arrival it doesn't tell us what type of response we saw to the vaccine uh, you know numerically we're seeing higher but obviously there's no statistical difference there between those so uh, what type of response did we see is, is kind of a uh, kind of interesting now as we look at day 56 so day 28 uh, your nasal gen delayed group and your vista 5 group uh, were vaccinated as we look at at, at that um, essentially what we're seeing is we saw a nice amnestic response in the vista delay group but we didn't necessarily see any statistical difference uh, between um, the nasal gen delayed group so one thing is as we visit with immunologists and, and try to determine what's the what may is possibly the cause of what we're seeing in this particular scenario what we found was uh, what they've they've seen on several occasions and and with the research that they've done is if we have intranasal exposure and we follow that or intranasal vaccination and we boost that with an intranasal um, within the first within 30 days or e even some of the studies have shown up to 60 days that we may not get a strong amnestic response if we stimulate a good immune response up front so there's still some questions around this and uh, in my mind and, and we're trying to work through some of those questions with with some of our um, some of the immunologists out there but um, you know it, it sure demonstrates that when we throw a, considering that 
half these cattle had not received a viral vaccination uh, at the time that the virus started to work its way through the, through them. Uh, we can see that, you know, as this BRSV went through, we, we were seeing basically in the ballpark of a 20 to, to 30 percent pull rate in these animals. The animals that had been vaccinated did not have, we did not see as high a pull rate as the animals, as the animals that hadn't been vaccinated, uh, but numerically. So, um, this was kind of interesting to us as, as we were able to demonstrate and, and see that most likely we just had a BRSV that, that made its way through uh, this. As we look at what the information that came out of the SCR tags that, that were put in, those SCR tags, again, they, uh, they, they're going to measure for us, uh, they're going to measure activity. So, you know, how many minutes a day are, are these animals active? And it's also going to measure rumination. So how, how much rumination do we see taking place? And as we start to, uh, as we start to look at what's going, what's going on, um, with these, with the activity, uh, I, I think it's a little bit interesting as, as we focus on the route of administration and, and the effects of injecting parenteral vaccinations that, and the effects that it may have on animals. You know, it, it's interesting that we see it didn't matter if it was cattle on arrival or cattle delayed. We didn't see a whole lot of difference in the activity within these animals uh, as these cattle came in. But also keeping in mind that the only thing that's delayed on these is the viral aspect. So the cattle also, they, they all received a dewormer and an injectable dewormer. Uh, they received uh, injectable antibiotic. They received a, a clostridial vaccine. So it wasn't until we got out, essentially we got out to about day 28, that we saw to 30 in there that we started to see a statistical difference in the separation uh, of, of activity. And, and it didn't last very long. But we start to see that separation really start to occur a little bit uh, and we see that start to occur in the delayed group uh, and, and a little separation starting there around day 22, going back to when they felt like the, the wild strain virus was going through the feed yard. That would uh, be about the time we started to see a decrease in the amount of in, in the activity in that group of animals in that in that delayed area. Now, as we go through uh, day 28, uh, the other thing that I'd, I'd point out is a lot of times, you know, as we look at how we handle cattle and, and things that we do, um, even though the cattle that, that were vaccinated on arrival on didn't get revaccinated, they did go through the chute. So all animals went through the chute. But as you can see uh, with this, in this scenario, uh, the cattle they were vaccinated on arrival, even though they went through the chute and we, we took them from their pens, we ran them down the alleyway, we ran through the chute, we took them back to their pen. Uh, they still had increased activity over the animals that, that were vaccinated on day, that received that vaccination on day 28. So the cattle that were vaccinated on day 28, again, received Vista 5 and, or they received Nasalgen 3 and Vista BVD. So both groups end up with a parenteral vaccination. It's just a matter of how did the IBR, BRSV, and PI3 go in, one being internasal and the other one being administered via um, a parenteral vaccination. If we look at rumination, I, I, I rumination slide in just for the simple fact that uh, what rumination showed us was as the cattle increased their feed intake, rumination increased and, and there was just no statistical difference. There was one point in time in 56 days that there was a statistical difference, which just it didn't fit into anything that would would even make us be able to try to figure out uh, what we may even been seeing there. So as we look at the summary of this study, um, First and foremost, you know, safety was was what we were looking for, and and we found that nasal gen three was safe when we put it in these high risk heifers entering the feed yard. Uh, as we look back, uh, as we look back at it, and we consider the morbidity that we saw in the animals, a lot of people will say that these may not have truly been uh, been high risk as high risk cattle of what we may have wanted to see, uh, just 
by looking at the data. But if we consider what the animals were when they came in uh, and, and the definitions that we look at with high risk cattle, long haul on the truck for eight hours or more, um, come in with dehydration, multiple multiple source uh, animals commingled and, and through sale barns, they, they did fit with the high risk aspect of it there. Uh, as we look at the difference between nasal gen 3 and Vista 5 with morbidity and mortality, there just wasn't much difference there at all. Uh, you know, you start to look at numbers and, and people can look at numbers and try to convince themselves of things, but, but that's why we throw statistics at it and, and try to see, okay, statistically, what are the chances that that's going to happen again? And, and uh, in this particular case, we just saw no difference between uh, the route of administration on morbidity and mortality. We did see fewer chronics in the heifers that received Vista 5 than we did than the heifers that received nasal gen 3. And again, going back, we had a large portion of cattle in the in the delayed nasal gen 3 that became uh, that essentially became uh, chronics. A, there was a statistical uh, significant decrease in the amount of animals that required third treatment, uh, the amount of animals that uh, were deemed chronically ill, and the antibiotic cost associated with disease. Uh, treatment the cattle that were vaccinated on arrival. So uh, this does not fit with uh, what Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Richardson has seen and with some of his other studies. Uh, but in this particular case, um, in this particular case, there was a statistical difference uh, favoring cattle that were vaccinated on arrival. As we look at the serum IgG titers, uh, essentially. IBR, BVD, and BRSV, they all tended to be numerically higher uh, in Vista 5 groups. And as we saw, there was uh, statistically, there was some that were higher. Um, if we look at the evaluation of the IgGG titers to BRSV, it sure indicated the possibility that, that we most likely had natural exposure to a wild strain um, BRSV um, that, that showed up. It says BVD. I apologize. That should be BRSV. So the overall morbidity uh, following metaphylactic uses of Prevo in this class of cattle, you know, is relatively low at 14 to 27 percent across the board. Um, so all in all, uh, what we were wanting to look at with this was, was really around safety and efficacy, and, and we were able to, to tease out a few uh, few things within it. But uh, sure, a study that I, I foresee will probably be uh, at some point in time will be repeated and, and maybe a uh, with increased numbers and, and things along that line. So with that, I want to thank everybody again for, for giving us time uh, to spend with you and, 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 and talk about some of the things we have going on at Merck, but more importantly, talk about what's going on within the, within the stocker sector. So thank you for your time. We look forward to getting back out and being able to spend. All right, so Dr. Parks, you're on. Do we have any questions for Dr. Park? Well, I, I'm going to ask you one, Tim. I knew that would happen. Hello. <laughs> so, so basically, you ran the trial. You saw the results. You saw that the chronics were higher in in the internasals. Which vaccine protocol would you do in the in these particular high risk cattle? Um, you know, I, I think there's so many variables in in this particular study. We we were in a small pen group. Um, we were in cattle that were receiving a, a, a fairly high energy diet. Um, so the management's different than what we're going to see in some of the others. So, uh, you know, I think there's so many variables that come into play. This is one study uh, that, and so I think there's so many variables that come into play that it's really between the veterinarian and the producer and the management and the cattle that are coming in. You know, this particular case, uh, it, you know, it favored the, the parenteral and uh, there's there's some been some research done uh, it, with some other products as well, looking at, you know, how, how does the internasal fit? Uh, so I, I think there's still some questions out there uh, as to how that's going to 
you know, which product works best. But there's so many variables, especially with management and cattle, uh, that, that I think that the veterinarian and the producer are going to be able to make that, that decision the best. So I'm hoping, you know, the goal of this study, was, again, was safety. But we really want to we want to make sure that we can get out there. Um, we we want to make sure that 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 the information that we have it helps you guys make decisions as you as you look at it. We're looking at repeating this study. Uh, I've got one that'll be starting. It'll be a large pen study, and and it's going to compare uh, nasal gen three, but but along with the the PMH uh, aspect to Vista once uh, with some arrival stuff and then some some reback. So uh, you know we've got quite a few studies going, just trying to get more information out, but. This was really the first go around beyond efficacy and some of the safety work we've done with this product uh, in particular. Okay, so we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, said, can you comment on a protocol of arrival internasal followed by a 28 day injectable? Yeah, there. Uh, that's that's one aspect that I think we're going to see some people uh, looking at. Um, it goes back to the research that, that the immunologists have done. And if we're able to stimulate a strong immune response at the internasal route, uh, where we, we get an IgA response, we get an IgG response, uh, what they've demonstrated is we may not get that response with an internasal. Uh, just because we're going to put it into the nasal cavity, we're going to put it right there where we've already stimulated a response, and we may negate some of the effect of our vaccine as we look at IgA and IgG. Now, what happens at the cellular level, uh, you know, that's something that we really haven't looked at. So it, what cell-mediated things may be going on as far as a booster aspect. But when we go parenterally, we can see an amnestic response. We've been able to demonstrate that several times. Um, so, so I think that is an option. Uh, that we'll see. I also think that we'll probably see some people that that will go just the opposite of that and go with a parenteral on arrival and then maybe come back with a boost later of an internasal. But uh, again, I mean, just multiple different multiple different uh, protocols out there working with, you know, you guys working with your producers are going to be, you, you know, their management better than, than anybody. So uh, that's where we can uh, where we can look at. So another question we have is any plan to run a trial giving both vaccines at the same time? And I, I take it that's where they're talking about giving the parenteral and the internasal both to the animals. Yeah, that's not one that we have that we're looking at right now. I know we've looked at some data from some other studies that have been done looking at that. Um, but we have not. Uh, that's that's one that I'm, I can't say that we're not going to do it. But at this point in time, uh, we're looking at some other some other trial studies to get information out around this product as well. All right. So basically, we're not going to recommend doing that at this time. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't. I, you know, we don't have the ev any evidence uh, one way or the other on that. Uh, you know, we're. Uh, we're stimulating at two different levels. Uh, we're stimulating the mucosal surface. We're stimulating uh, with a parenteral at a different level, but uh, but we're doubling up on a lot of antigens. So, um, you know, especially in the high risk cattle, where are we at with that? Um, I'm not, uh, you know, we, we just haven't looked at it enough to, to make a recommendation one way or the other on that. Uh, another question we have is they wanted to know why we weren't didn't use a negative control or unvaccinated animals. Well, uh, just because of the high risk category, the high risk of them, the number of animals that we were looking at with it, uh, you know, and we start to uh, start thinking about what death loss can be. Uh, so we, we elected to go with a positive control uh, with Vista because we know, you know, with with one of the primary uh things that we're looking at being safety we've, we've got a good uh safety history of vista so we're going to go with the positive control that way and and uh, try to eliminate uh, some of the possible uh, increased mortality that we may have seen in that negative control group anybody else have any more questions I 
see we have 132 participants. I know we've got to have some inquiring minds out there somewhere. Well, if, if they do have some, be sure and uh, get them in to us and we'll try to get the answers out to you. Thank you guys. You know, I, I just want to tell you guys, thank you again for, for jumping on Dr. Epperson, uh, Dr. Newcomb. Thanks for, for the work you did putting this together. Uh, we sure enjoy, I enjoy the meeting. I, I know that the veterans enjoy the meeting. We just look forward to the day when we'll be able to do it in a different manner. Mississippi State this time of year is a pretty good place to be. Dr. Epperson. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, this is Dee Griffin. Can I ask one question? It took me a while to get unmuted. Um, I haven't used intranasal vaccines in a long time, but most of the cowboys, when you walk in with an intranasal vaccine, they they get their hackles up kind of like a, a banny rooster, and you're not real happy with the vet. Have you guys thought, are you, is there a better system for delivering intranasal vaccines than there was uh, when I was a pup? Well, I would say that the system is probably about the same. Uh, you know, intranasal vaccines, the, the one thing, um, I, I know what you mean. We, we've all seen how creative people can get with administration of products, and uh, this is truly intranasal. One nice thing uh, about this product uh, and, and this is something that we that we do here really at the cat branch level uh, where we have a man, a manager of those animals that's kind of overseeing what's going on with the blue aspect to it. Uh, it has created a, a little bit stronger compliance aspect uh, that the cowboys and the people that are, are handling these animals try to do a little bit better job because the blue does show up. We know we're going to get some leak back, but the leak back out of the nostrils one thing when we got a uh, blue streak up the up the forehead that's a whole different story so um but we we've created some new atomizers uh that kind of uh that will create a spray uh that they're a, they're a longer one that goes up the nasal cavity uh, we've had we've had mixed results uh mixed reviews on those uh but it creates a mist rather than just being a stream um so there, there's multiple things that have been done, but uh, it really boils down to restraint and making sure that we're doing it properly. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I agree with you, Dr. Griffith. They, uh, there's quite a few of them that when we mention intranasal, uh, they, their attitude changes a little bit. But uh, there's, re there's definitely in, in certain areas, there's some advantages uh, that we can create some different opportunities with some of these intranasals when we put them into these animals. Well, I, I, I used an intranasal as part of my graduate work at Purdue University in challenged IBR cattle. And the death loss in challenged cattle was, the difference was beyond statistically significant. It, 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 was, uh, it had two zeros before you saw any numbers. So in the face of a challenge, the intranasal, and we did it two different years, one with DSV2 and one with nasal gen. And, and it was, uh, by the way, it was supervised by Harold Amstutz. So I think you can consider it was probably done okay. But um, it, 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 it was a lifesaver for the cattle that were challenged. Tim, Tim we have uh, one, two more questions uh, coming in. First, one of the first questions was, did the lot change the viral vaccine SOP after these results? And I think the answer to that would be no, since Dr. Bechtel runs an experimental feed yard. So I think that that was a, a fairly easy one. And then the next one is how often should these ion cannulas be changed, uh, changed while processing? How many cattle can we process without changing? You know, we, we really need, we need to say we need to change them between animals. Uh, and uh, one thing that, um, you know, when we think about what we're doing with these, uh, with, with some of the older style cannulas uh, that we're sticking up the nose, we can create some, you know, there's the potential to create some trauma depending on how we utilize it. That's why restraint becomes so critical. Uh, we know that we can transfer some things from one place to the other. Um, you know, that we really need to, uh, we really need to say change it in between each animal 
Uh, but it's pretty hard to tell somebody that when uh, when the the dewormer hooks hanging on the chute. Uh, so, you know, when we start to think about the things that we're uh, that we're doing BQA wise, and and as we start to think about moving uh, pathogens from one animal to the other, it, it's not just how often do we change a, a nasal cannula, but how often are we doing the other things? So. Um, my answer to you is we got to say we need to change them in between animals, uh, but uh, it, it creates a pretty good opportunity to have a nice discussion with your producers as well. So. All right. So uh, another question is, and, and, and you can answer this. Uh, can we just do it one one ml and, and one nostril, two mls and one nostril, or do we need to go up both nostrils? It's labeled both ways, so uh, we can see it. It can be given one cc per nostril, or you can shoot two cc's uh, up one. Uh, so those are. Uh, uh, it, it can be given either way. This the the product, you know, nasal gen three uh, right now is being used with one spmhin. So in that particular scenario, we see two cc's up each nostril, uh, but other ones. Uh, other ones may go one cc, but it goes back to uh, it goes back to Dr. Dr. D's uh, statement about cowboys getting their hackles up a little bit. You know, if if we can get them to stick the cannula up one nose and get two cc's in it, I think we're in pretty good shape. All right, and then another question we had was, what's your ideal revac time, or do you revac? You know, I think revac uh, again. That fits into a management scenario. That fits into a, a veterinarian personal preference because the there's data that would kind of indicate both ways. Um, I don't. I personally, uh, I guess, I don't feel like there's a set revac time frame that we're gonna that we're gonna revac. Uh, but it goes back to management and how people are managing those cattle and and, and their labor force as far as how they're they're going about observation and, and treatment of those cattle. So, um, you know, we, we've got research that would that would put it out there. Any, we've done research at 14 days. We've done some research at, at 28 days. Uh, I've got a pretty large study that we're going to revac at four, 14 days. So uh, uh, hopefully next year about this time, I'll have a better answer for you on that with a lot of cattle. All right, and, and, and another question was, did you do any post-mortem uh, diagnostics on any of the deads to see what the organism was that was causing the issue. No, we did not on, on the deads. We had uh, essentially we had three deads uh, that came out uh, that came out of it, and they did not uh, they did not culture those that I have seen. But uh, I don't. Do you have who asked that question? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, Doctor Prather. Uh, I'll write that down, and if I, uh, I I will I will check because that's that is a great question uh, to see what if they cultured that. All right, and then here's one from Dr. Meadows wants to know uh, if there is a delivery. Do we have anything a a uh, I guess like a, a syringe for internasal? A syringe for the internasal. We do have a syringe for internasal. Uh, there's one that uh, that has a uh, it, it's a bottle mount syringe. Uh, we have the cannulas and the cannulas that that we have would fit right on. They they fit on a slip tip uh, application to a syringe, so they can go on it on any type of syringe. Um, but those those would be the main application we need to have. All right, and uh, I see we have another one in here that says they recently saw an abstract saying that stream delivery of internasal vaccines elicited an equivalent response to aerosol delivery. Anyone else recall seeing any any comments on that, Tim? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I did see that one. Um, and what they were looking at was, you know, do we do we create a mist? Uh, the, the thought process behind it is if we can create a mist, we're going to contact more of the mucosal surface, have a chance of picking up more of the mucus, uh, and get less uh, less leak back. <clears throat> but I guess that you know that particular study showed that there was there was really no difference uh, in that 
it goes back to we're going to see some leak back. And, and when we do the blue, we know we're going to see some leak back. That's one of the things that shows up uh, as we start to look at that. So um, we're going to see the leak back, but the leak back that occurs, as we all know, isn't as, as much as what it would appear. Uh, and we're getting enough of a stimulation of that immune system. Uh, and we're, we're accomplishing what we need to with this, with that dosage. Yeah, Neil, 